You may have heard that Toledo Opera is presenting one of those operas that we just heard from, the opera Il Trovatore, or The Troubadour, by Giuseppe Verdi. You may have recognized that anvil chorus. There's also a special Tuesday talk, which is happening tomorrow. It's September 28th, going on at 6 o'clock p.m. It's going to be virtually offered via Toledo Opera's Facebook page, also their YouTube channel. We do want to mention that Toledo Opera is a sponsor and part of programs here on WGTE. So what we're going to do now is bring in a few different guests uh, that are going to be on the panel tomorrow, as well as uh, one person who is coming on board to uh, sort of be our guinea pig for the afternoon, um, having not really become familiar with Torbatore, but hopefully by the end of this discussion you'll know a little bit more about it. I'm talking about Dave Ross. Uh, Dave, let's start with you. You're an artist in Toledo. No relation, I assume, to Bob Ross, right? No, no no relation. Yeah. I wish, though. <laughs> well, let me go through the list, and then I'll come back to uh, all of you, and you can tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, Dave Ross is here. We also have Dr. Naomi Andre, who is a professor in Department of Afro-American and African Studies, Women's and Gender Studies, and the Residential College at the University of Michigan. Dr. Andre has joined us by phone. Hello. Hello there. It's a pleasure to be here. May I call you Naomi for the purposes Absolutely. of our discussion? Okay, great. No problem. We're also joined by Sonia Flunder McNair, right? I yes. said that correctly. You are the founder of Urban Holistics. And, you know, if people are wondering what that has to do with opera, well, we'll tell you in just a minute. And then we also have with us Alyssa Greenberg, who is the Community Engagement Director of Toledo Opera. Hello, Alyssa. Hi, Brad. Thanks for having us. Now, let's rewind and, and go back to Dave. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Dave, so people uh, know you. And a lot of folks know your work. They don't necessarily know the, the person behind the work. So give us a little clue. Okay, I'm uh, David Ross. I'm a community artist, which means I do mainly work that addresses issues in community. I don't do freelance art as much as most people. And my day job is I'm a creative placemaking project manager for the uh, Toledo Arts Commission. Wow, so, yeah, wonderful. That's what I do. And, and let's turn to you, Sonia. Tell us a little bit about what you do with Urban Holistics. Yes, um, Urban Holistics, I'm the executive director. Um, I see to uh, the operations of our uh, green space, our holistic green space, which is Tatum Park. And um, during the day, I function my for-profit business, Sonia Organics, and I teach organic formulation um, with products. And I am uh, a community urban farmer on the urban holistic side. Wow, I feel so inadequate after hearing what everybody else is doing here. Uh, Naomi, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what you do. And and you're going to be sort of the, the go-to source in the discussion we have today and tomorrow as well, uh, because you're very, very familiar with this opera, Il Trovatore, um, which you, I believe you did a, a dissertation on, correct? Oh, well, yes, Azucena and Il Trovatore was one of the operas I looked at. So I am a musicologist trained in historical musicology. I think a lot about opera. However, as I sort of describe what I do, I think about opera and ask unusual questions about opera in um, traditional and non-traditional spaces. So I think about opera on opera stages here in the U.S. and Europe. I think about opera in South Africa after this dismantling of apartheid. I think about opera when I was teaching in a women's prison um, about 30 minutes from where I live. So I love asking questions about opera that um, are not always the ones everybody asks about. And with Strovratore, I'm really interested in sort of how Verdi is creating the drama through these, um, well, particularly through Azucena, but with all the characters. There's, it's a, a story that's not easy to understand, but it is it, pretty exciting once you do. Well, let's talk about that story a little bit, because, I mean, the plot is absolutely crazy, but, you know, it could be something ostensibly ripped from the headlines. It could be very contemporary when put in context, and, and that's part of the reason that you have the guests that you have. 
uh, participating in this panel discussion. We don't we don't want to get too spoilery in talking about all of this, but we do want to touch on some of these themes. And I think a good place to start is with the plot because there's so much going on. Um, Naomi, do you want to give us sort of a a highlight of, of what happens with all these characters? Sure. The um, opera plots are notoriously complicated, and this is really extra true for um, Trovatore. But the key to understanding the plot of Il Trovatore, it's based on a play from 1836 by um, Antonio Garcia Gutierrez, a Spanish uh, playwright, called El, uh, and the play was El Trovador, the Troubadour. There is so much, both um, or in the opera, that happens before the the curtain rises. So there's a prehistory to Trovatore. And once people understand that, then what happens on stage makes a little more sense. Mm -hmm. In the prehistory, you have this horrible situation. We're talking the original plot is set in medieval Spain, the 14th century, and you have um, a migrant wandering sort of group of Romani people, and one of the people is Azucena's mother, and she is um, thought to have put a curse on the Count's son, and so she is killed, burned at the stake. Yeah. And what she says to her daughter, Azucena, as she is dying, is, please avenge me. And so the opera all opens with Azucena is very much in this um, traumatized state that her mother has been killed, and she's trying to figure out what to do. She has avenged her mother before the opera began, and what we find out through different narratives in the um, opera, we have Ferrando, who is sort of the leader of the men's chorus, and he has this big sort of racconto in the beginning, and we basically find out the story that um, Azucena has gone to avenge her mother. She has stolen the Count's baby. She herself happens to have a son right around the same age, a baby. And as she is in this um, horrible event of, of trauma, living through what happened with her mother's death, she sets a fire and she throws a baby into the fire, which is a horrifying thing. And to make it even more complicated, is that she does not throw the Count's baby into the fire. She throws her own baby. So not that there's ever the right or the wrong baby to throw into a fire, because (laughs) that's just a horrifying thing. But she has now raised Manrico as her own son, even though he is really the Count's brother. And, and he's the he's the troubadour, right, of the title. Right. Yeah. And he's the troubadour, and he is falling in love with Leonora, and Leonora is falling in love with him, and then the Count de Luna is also in love with Leonora. So there's your typical um, opera triangle, love yeah. triangle. The, the Count but is the Count- actually the brother of Manrico, but they don't know that yet. See, right. are you guys following this so far? <laughs> it's tough, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's tough, and and we're just getting started. I mean, Sonia is over there taking notes, so I don't know. <laughs> You're trying to make sure you know all this stuff. Yes. Okay, so we've got this prehistory. This this woman Azucena, who is the daughter of the woman who was burned at the stake when she was young, she threw the baby into the fire. It was her own baby. And she kept and raised Manrico, who is actually the brother of the Count, and the three of them are in a love triangle. How's that? My, yeah, my, okay. very good. Hopefully now people will get it. Twice said, hopefully. <laughs> so that all happens before the curtain even rises in the beginning. Right. I'm just getting it myself for the first time. So now, <laughs> you, so the curtain rises, and, and then what happens? I mean, I assume this is the good stuff that's going to happen. And when I say good stuff, I mean like the drama of the, uh, the right, piece. Sort of the typical mid 19th century opera where you have a tenor who's Manrico, the troubadour, and he um, has been raised by Azucena. He sings beautifully. Leonora has fallen in love with him. She is a lady of the court. And um, the Count wants to marry Leonora because he's the Count and she's a lady of the court. So that sort of makes sense. 
But there's the problem with Manrico, and she's fall in the heart cannot be you know told what to do and so there's that little triangle happening then you have Azucena Manrico's mother and she's this added really exciting different type of character who's in the opera because she loves her son and yet she's filled with this trauma for having a done, what happened to her mother and then having done this horrible event with burning a child and so Manrico is sort of ping pongs between be, having time with Leonora and then his mother is wandering and gets put in jail and then he wants to marry Leonora but then his mother needs him for something else so there's really I don't know a, a a quartet of troubles going on because you have Manrico and the Count de Luna vying for Leonora, but you also have Leonora and Azucena both needing Manrico, and so he's trying to figure out what to do. Everybody's still with us? Poor Manrico. (laughs) Yes, there's a lot of drama. (laughs) There's a lot of drama, and, you know, nobody's even died yet, so (laughs) hold on to your hat. Because, you know, almost everybody dies at the end of this opera. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be an opera without... I got a question now. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. How, how does she burn the wrong baby? <laughs> well, uh, that is a good question. And, and it's a question... She's trying to avenge her mother. Yeah. And so this is her way to do it, but it gets all... Because sometimes when terrible things happen, you're not thinking straight. And I think the way to understand Azucena, it's easy to portray her as a crazy woman, Mm. the other, the person who is not part of the court, but she's part of this wandering migrant community. And I think that undercuts a lot of the strength of her character. Because if we take her seriously as a woman who's gone through such trauma, and she's trying to figure out what to do in an impossible situation, then her not knowing what to do and sort of being in between their parts in the opera where she seems to remember what happens and her big raconto and she's talking about the flames are rising up and um, Manrico at the end says, so wait a minute, am I not your child? And she says, oh no, no, don't listen to that. That's not true. So she herself is in between knowing what happened and then being compelled through this drive. When did she find out that it was the wrong child? Oh, she's known that from before the opera. Yeah. But Manrico doesn't know. She's hidden that story. So it's part of her plot for revenge, eventually. And, I mean, we can skip ahead here. We don't want to spend the whole time talking about the, the <laughs> plot of the opera because you could easily do that. But... Um, you know, there's a love triangle between the three of them, uh, between the Count, between Manrico, and between Leonora. Um, eventually, Leonora decides she's not going to belong to anybody. She kills herself, so that's, you know, said and done. Um, it, it's more complicated than that. Uh, the, the Count kills Manrico, and then Azucena's, you know, revenge is complete because she tells him, you killed your brother. Right. Did I miss any important plot, plot points there? No, uh, yeah, no, no, that pretty much <laughs> um, ha- handles it. Basically, Whoa. what That's happens, savage. yeah, it's pretty intense. So for the mother's curse to really be fulfilled, Manrico has to die, even though Azutena doesn't want to kill Manrico because she's raised him as her own son. Right. And so we have Azutena is wandering around, And the Count knows that, um, or the Count feels that Azucena needs to, she's dangerous, and so he puts her in jail. Azucena, uh, or Manrico, this is his mother, and so he goes to say, this is my mother, and he goes to be with her. So he's in jail. Leonora wants to um, save Manrico, because he's now in jail with his mother. So Leonora says to the Count, I will marry you. You Just free Manrico. Just free him. And what she does is she takes some poison because she's going to be true to Manrico, so nobody will have her. You know, she can't have the person she wants or that she believes in. Leonora goes to the prison where Manrico and his mother Azucena are. She has taken the poison so she can remain faithful to him. But she says to Manrico, 
go. You're free now. And Manrico says, oh, great. Are you coming with me? And Leonora can't because she's supposed to be with the Count. And so she says, no, I can't, but you are free. And she's made this heroic sacrifice for him. He doesn't know it, and he gets mad, and he thinks she's going to sell herself out to the Count. And so Manrico says, no, fine, I'll go to the gallows and I'll be killed. And then he goes, Leonora dies. As Utena, who'd been sleeping, wakes up, and as soon as Manrico is killed, she says to the Count, you just killed your brother. And that's the end of the curtain. That's, that's, that's the curtain edge on the down. seat <laughs> drama. It is edge on the seat drama. Is that is all opera like that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. I, can, I can't believe, I see people while they're infatuated with watching opera. Well, I can see this young generation like really just like, Daytime soap opera. Yeah, yes. that was a deep. That was a lot. Like a soap opera. Yes. I, I mean, we spent a good fifteen minutes on that, but but it's important for people to have a have yeah. a good idea of, of what is going on because believe me, all the other synopses get easier from from here. You, this is like it the does. hardest one to chew. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, it, it's interesting. I know tomorrow you guys are going to talk about, well, the, the, the theme, contemporary themes like love, trauma, and motherhood. That's the title of the, the talk tomorrow. Um, this is happening at 6 o'clock p.m. It's going to be offered virtually from Toledo Opera's Facebook page and their YouTube channel. You're going to dive into some of these questions, but I'm interested, like Dave, you know, you had the question of why'd she throw her own baby in there. That speaks maybe a little bit to mental health, which is, you know, something, Sonia, that you address with uh, your activities as well. Uh, let me ask you, Sonia, what, what, after hearing what goes on, and this is completely devoid of, of the music or anything in this drama, I mean, what are your impressions of this story and its relevance to the kind of work that you do? Um, it's, it's kind of sobering how relevant it is. Um, I lost a child, so I know how you can think irrationally, mm. um, when you are dealing with trauma and sadness, um, illness, and on top of that, a, uh, environment that, um, is totally unhealthy. Yeah. So, um, it speaks to me in so many different ways. And so um, the whole point uh, of what I do as far as s keeping well mentally is being able to um, absorb beautiful spaces. Um, we see a lot of, uh, we, we deal with trauma by what we see. We absorb a lot of it in our community. Um, and trying to create spaces and beautiful uh, areas to where we can actually have a place to not even um, say go speak to someone about because we always say we need to go speak to someone but a, a place to heal yeah. um, is important yeah absolutely well I think in, in the terms in the context of the opera maybe that healing was not addressed I mean they went for the, the blood and guts the gore of, of the story itself but it raises a lot of questions and like you say your own personal experience finding resonance in in this story and this story was written in the 1850s i mean the story was written before that the opera was written in the 1850s so you know these are issues that have been with us in one way or the other uh for a very long time but yes. your personal experience obviously is is wrapped up a little bit in, in some of the themes of this opera dave you asked that question about you know, why did she kill her own baby? And, and that led us into it, uh, talking about the feelings of motherhood and and mental health and all those things. But your impressions, Dave, as an artist, you know, you, you documented some of the most, I would say, iconic events as far as like the George Floyd mural that you did. Mm -hmm. Um, these are stories that are still going on that are full of violence of, of one person against another person. I mean, what are your thoughts? If this were happening today, um, how would you represent it in your art if this kind of story had, had come to you and become a part of your your catalog, as it were? Well, it, it does happen today. 
in my yeah. opinion. Um, I've seen many different situations, whether in media or knowing locally from happening where um, a person is triggered and would sacrifice his family because they don't want to lose someone or they don't, you know, it, it could be narcissist behavior, whether or not the reason, but I've, it's happened here where people have murdered their own family. Yeah. From saying someone can't leave me, so that just to to me when I look at that, I look at um, there's no solution to avoid from people with narcissist behavior that will take a life, but there is awareness on triggers. So that's what I would do, like creatively, I would try to give people a way to creatively address their triggers, mm -hmm. because if someone leaving you may trigger from abandonment issues. You know, you can figure a way to address that creatively, like um, letting that person know how you feel that you don't, you know, feel like you can live without them. You know, instead of saying, I'm going to take your life, you know, maybe you can express how you feel a better way. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's what I would have done. Well, the, and that's a purpose that art has served. You yes. Know, ever since its inception really yeah. um now dave you're not going to be on the panel tomorrow night i sort of feel like you should add him Alyssa. <laughs> great <laughs> put him on there because uh great things that you have to say dave is involved in um uh everything that toledo opera is doing with the opera blue which is in february i believe and we went to see it together actually yeah. up at uh, detroit uh, uh, michigan opera theater not very long ago and you know, a lot of, even though that was a contemporary opera which addressed contemporary themes in the context of the African American community and the police community, um, it has some resonance that, that speaks to everything that goes on in Il Trovatore and the Troubadour, even though it's like a really old story and it's set in medieval Spain. These are characters that we can all identify with in one way or the other. Definitely. And and you guys certainly have pers the personal experience that 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 helps you identify with those characters. I want to talk about the music a little bit, and, and Naomi, maybe you can address this briefly. The idea that I mean, Verdi was above all a, a consummate creator of drama in his music. There are all these great scenes, these great moments. Um, you know, the second act dealing with the gypsy opens with that anvil chorus that we heard earlier that you all mentioned. You may you may have heard it one time or the other. Um, it also has a great scene where the tenor is like singing high seas, which are as high as a tenor gets for the most part, um, and rushes off stage, you know, to save his mother. Uh, there's also the great aria that the character of Azucena, Azucena sings, uh, recounting her the fire, you know, that consumed her mother and her child. Um, Naomi, can you tell us a little bit about, put Verdi in, in context as far as the drama that he creates with with his music? Sure. Well, Il Trovatore is an opera that was right in the beginning of his middle period. So the early period is looking to Rossini, Bellini, Donizetto in the, Donizetti, excuse me, in the early Prima Ottocento. And this is where Verdi is really getting his, sort of, he knows the conventions of the time. And then he's playing around and doing really different things. So one of the really different things is the story he has. Opera stories are always out of control, but this one goes over the top. And he was so interested in the character of Azucena. Whereas in this time period in 1853, we're expecting a leading tenor and a leading soprano. However, Verdi is saying, no, it's Azucena is the character I'd want to sing if I were a prima donna. <laughs> and Leonora, the um, more typical soprano heroine, he saw her initially as more of a comprimaria, the smaller role. So one of the really daring things he's doing in his career where he's just like saying, I've gone through all my training and now I'm, you know, asserting my own voice, is this very unusual role of Azucena. 
And he gives her music that is very, the whole world of the Romani people. He gives them very sparkly um, with um, triangles and symbols, and there's a very exotic element. But it's also some of the most memorable and wonderful tunes. So as Verdi is known for writing beautiful tunes, La Donna Immobile is from Rigoletto, right. which is right before this opera. Verdi has the anvil chorus, but he doesn't give it to the aristocracy. He gives it to this unusual, brave um, character who he absolutely fell in love with, Azucena. So the music really sparkles. The um, the other characters, a tough thing about this opera is that you have four leading roles, whereas I said the norm was having more two roles, the soprano and the tenor. We have that because Leonora, who was originally the smaller role, was made into a bigger role because that's what everybody was expecting. But the Count de Luna, the baritone, he has a big role. So musically, he's still working within the bounds, but he's stretching them. And he's stretching them to make space for this unusual female character. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about this to no end. I mean, each of these characters is multidimensional in the way that they're portrayed. You know, they have they sing arias, which on in the theater would be like a soliloquy, which lends us some insight not only into uh, the drama, keeps the drama moving, keeps the story moving, but also tells us something about the character themselves. And as I understand it, Verdi even flirted with the idea of calling the opera Azucena instead of uh, Il Trovatore, the troubadour. Is yes, it, he was thinking of calling it La Gitana. Yeah. He got it. Yeah. But then the librettist he was working with, um, who was actually a very, um, was an older gentleman, Salvadore Camarano, who died actually right before the libretto was finished. So then another person came in, Bardare. But Camarano was like, wait a minute, you can't do this. He kept trying to keep it more conventional. Uh, okay. Camarano was the um, librettist of Lucia de Lamamore, Donizetti's 1835 opera. So Verdi loved working with him. He'd worked with him before but he was really pushing to new new directions. Yeah. Well, let's let's have a little listening party here. I just want to play the uh, it's about two and a half minutes long. The aria Stride la Vampa, which is sung by the character of Azucena. Do you want to uh, set this up for us? Naomi tell us in context where it belongs. Sure. This is in the second act, and in the first act we meet Leonora and Manrico. But the second act is where we get to meet Azucena. And she's singing, this is in that camp of her migrant community. And she is looking, you can imagine they're at a campfire, and she's actually looking into the flames, and it's bringing her back to that space all those years ago that still haunts her and triggers her. And she starts telling the stories of her mother being killed. And then we sort of get confused as to her mother being killed and then when she's doing the vengeance of killing a baby so the flames are rising and and she's telling the story yeah let's uh, let's listen to it now that we have the context let's listen to the music and uh, we'll come back and talk about it <laughs> Yeah. 
So that is the aria of the uh, the Azucena, who is talking about her mother uh, dying in the fire, throwing the baby in the fire, all those things that we talked about before. Um, I mean, it's in Italian, so we can't understand the words, but the words are projected on uh, super titles, right, in English, Alyssa, so there's no need to worry about that. I'm just curious what your reactions are to hearing this kind of music. I mean, I've always thought that opera is sort of a controlled way of expression. You know, I used to be an opera singer, and, and when I sang a high note, I always thought, you know, in the real world, world, I would just be screaming my head off. And people do that over issues like these. There are primal screams. There are screams of anger. There is controlled screaming, which is opera, <laughs> you know. But, th- th- I mean, there's obviously more of an art to it. But what are your impressions having heard just this little bit of Torovatore, Dave, you, you look like you you have something to say. Yeah, well, because um, I've always listened to symphony, and I never really paid attention to that. Most of the opera, I mean, most of the what I was listening to was opera, mm-hmm. and I never associated with a visual or story. And now, going back and listening to this with the story, it's kind of like making me want to go back and listen to everything <laughs> with the story. You know what I'm saying? And I just, I feel like um, the some of the things that we go through in, in um community right now with like violence and things going on i can i i see a resolution in maybe something like a new form of opera yeah you know because totally. some of the things i see lacking in community is empathy and and um just understanding the the, the process of taking a life or um hurting someone and yeah. opera captures all these emotions you know so it does it, indeed. it get my creative juices flowing when i hear it you know yeah. I see it. what about you sonia what are you what are you thinking when you hear this music it was intense yeah. um it it brought up some emotion because even though i couldn't understand the words um i can uh feel um being an empath you <laughs> yeah. you can feel uh Feel you can the, feel the people reactions. in the room. You yeah. can feel reactions. So um, piggybacking off of what Dave said, I think what um, me being introduced to uh, opera was in high school. I went to Rogers High School. And if you were ever um, late or had a detention, um, your big or your uh, your punishment would be to sit in school and opera will be played the whole time you're sitting there <laughs> the whole time so we were introduced wow. um where we were in troubled situations <laughs> and it brought me back to sitting in a room where you couldn't say anything but just do your work over opera um i guess i guess how i want to approach this is uh we we talk about triggers and uh Dave talked about the triggers. That's my piggyback. Some of the triggers that people within our inner city community deal with, most people wouldn't understand. Yeah. So when when we have an opportunity like, opportunity like this to come to the table to explain um what we see on a daily um and how we're uh dealing with it, um people may feel as animalistic or we uh are targeting our own or it's it's a black on black issue and it's not even that it's that uh there hasn't been really too many resolutions to um 
things that we deal with or that we see on a daily. Um, families uh, at each other, like Dave said, we've seen and witnessed families kill each other um, over things that we will consider small. Um, the small things that we will consider uh, not even an issue to carry on a, out and act like that can be, uh, like I said, an active trigger to someone's trauma. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's how I dealt with the triggers living in the community that I uh, uh, actually grew up in and um, still live in and work in and my business is in. Uh, I felt that the triggers were um, not only mine, but the whole entire um, cities. So to actively get up and figure out a way to fix some of the things is um, how I'm dealing with, you know, the the, uh, you know, what we're seeing in our community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the issues that that both of you raise and talk about are are so important and obviously relevant to our society today. I I think that it's wonderful that we're able to, you know, look back a little bit on what people have done and thought and created in the past, because nobody's going to argue with the fact that Verdi was a great opera composer. But are those operas relevant today? Well, this little bit of a discussion that we've had certainly opens a door to that discussion. And I should say that uh, all of these uh, ideas are going to be dealt with in much more detail Mm -hmm. uh, at the Tuesday talk, which is happening uh, tomorrow, September 28th. It's uh, live at 6 o'clock p.m. You can find it online. That is at Toledo Opera's Facebook page, also on their YouTube channel, and then you guys will archive it afterward, right? So folks can can look at it on demand, and perhaps go see this this opera because, you know, you mentioned uh, Naomi that there are four lead roles. You need four fantastic singers in order to to pull this opera <laughs> off, right? Yes, a- and you. you definitely have them, I think, in this this production with uh, Leo Crocetto, who's a, just a fantastic, world-famous soprano. Carl Tanner, wonderful tenor. Uh, Deborah Nan Steele, who's going to be joining the panel. Is that right, uh, Alyssa, tomorrow? So we're going to have a recording of her singing one of the arias. Okay, okay. Because the panel overlaps with rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> well, the show must go on, as they say. You've also got uh, Kyle Fortmiller as as the Count de Luna. Um well, I want to thank all of you for talking today. You know, we, we talked a little bit about these themes. I didn't want to get too far into it because we could be here for hours on end, you know, listening and talking. But uh, I know that you'll address some of these issues tomorrow. Um, I want to thank the people who spoke with me today. However, that is uh, Dr. Naomi Andre from uh, University of Michigan. Also, Sonia Flunder McNair, who is founder of Urban Holistics, and also your company, Sonia. Remind me again, because I don't have it written down here. Sonia Organics. Sonia Organics. Well, that was easy. I could have remembered that. (laughs) And uh, we also spoke with Dave Ross, local community artist and activist uh, here in in, uh, Toledo, who is also going to be talking to us more about uh, Blue when that happens in February. And also Alyssa Greenberg for setting all this up. Alyssa is the Community Engagement Director at Toledo Opera. Thank you, Alyssa. Thanks so much for having us.